Hi, welcome to another policy video from Ontario 360, a project housed at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. I'm Sean Spear, the project co-director of Ontario 360 and a senior fellow at the Monk School. I'm pleased to be joined as always um, by my project co-director, Drew Fagan, who is also a professor at the Monk School. And most importantly, we're joined today by Chris Spoke, uh, who's a real estate investor and founder and CEO of August, a Toronto-based digital agency. Chris is the author of a new briefing note published at the Ontario 360 project entitled, It's Time to Build, Liberalizing Ontario's Land Use Rules to Boost Market Rate Housing Supply. Chris, thank you so much for your contribution to the Ontario 360 project and for joining us today to talk about uh, the paper and its key insights. Yeah, thank you both for, for having me. Let's just start big picture, if that's okay. Um, there's a lot, been a lot of attention in recent years on the question of housing affordability in the province's major centers. And that uh, conversation or debate has tended to focus on um, the causes or sources of, of uh, housing un of un unaffordability issues. And in particular, the question of whether uh, the primary issue here is one of supply or one of demand. Uh, in the briefing note um, that you produced uh, for the Ontario 360 project, you really zero in on the issue of supply as uh, the primary way to understand um, these, these issues and questions of, of housing affordability. Maybe just to start, do you want to unpack why you think um, a supply is the primary problem here and, and why policymakers ought to focus on supply? Um, rather than demand if they want to ultimately address um, the province's housing affordability challenges? Yeah, yeah, I would love to. I, I, have, I have many thoughts, of course. Um, so, so the way I think about this is there are three ways to improve housing affordability in the province or, or really anywhere. And this is an exhaustive list, right? So you can reduce demand, you can increase supply, or you can set price controls. And, and that improves affordability for some people, but, but maybe not for everybody. Um, so, so the debate does often land on this, you know, is it a demand problem or a supply problem? Um, one data point that's kind of helped me think about this is, uh, was released by Scotiabank Economics. So they have two, two really interesting papers. The first kind of demonstrates that Canada has the fewest homes per capita of any G7 country. So right off the bat, um, you know, when we look at our peer countries in terms of the relative housing abundance or scarcity, we're, we're not doing so well. A second paper came out to show that Ontario, within Canada, again, the country with the fewest homes per capita of any G7 country, Ontario is tied with Alberta for the province with the fewest homes per capita of any Canadian province. Um, and I really think that, first of all, Scotiabank's, Scotiabank economics really did us a service in kind of cutting through a lot of the theorizing about demand versus supply. Those, those data points kind of speak for themselves, in my view. Um, but another way I think about this is, is what do we mean when we say uh, reduce demand? And what do we mean when we, when we say increase supply? When, when, we, when we talk about reducing demand, what is demand? Demand is people who want homes, right? So, so any reduction in demand will come at the cost of some group. And we could talk a little bit more about that. There, there's, there's maybe some ways to nitpick that. Increasing supply means building more homes for more people. And I just think it's a much more productive um, approach to this. I, I think first... It is supported by the data that we just don't have enough homes for the, for the amount of people that want homes in the province and certainly in our major cities. And two, when we talk about increasing supply, we're really just talking about production. And I think that has its own benefits, like, you know, like, like creating a bunch of jobs and, and contributing to intensification and, and all these other good things. So, um, yeah, so my view is we, we don't have nearly enough homes for the amount of people who want them. I think the Scotiabank economics papers support that. And then I think that is just like a good way to think about this. Let, let's take a, a mindset of abundance. Um, instead of like figuring out who gets a home and who doesn't in, in some sort of kind of demand uh, squid game, let's just build a lot, a lot more homes in the province. I'll, I'll turn it over to Drew in, in a minute. Um, but, you know, the, the point um, that a focus on supply is, is positive sum and a focus on demand is inherently zero sum, I think is an interesting Correct. way to think about these questions. If, if uh, viewers accept your premise as laid out in, in the paper that this is indeed a supply problem necessitating a, a policy response. What are some of the factors um, that have contributed to uh, the province's relative underperformance on housing supply? Yeah, so the, the way I like to say it is housing in Ontario is expensive because there's not enough of it. Okay, so that, that kind of under, underscores this supply problem. There's not enough of it. I mean, the short answer is we're not building enough of it. And, and of course, the follow-up is why aren't we building enough of it? And really, when you look at you know, the long list of supply constraints um, that, that have kind of exacerbated this problem. The most meaningful are municipal land use rules. 
Um, so this, this kind of refers to a broad set of rules and regulations, you know, within the rubric of zoning, but even kind of beyond that, um, which basically define for developers, right, our housing producers, where and when and what they're allowed to build. Um, and often, I think kind of uniformly, again, especially among major cities where we're seeing the most price pressure, uh, they're just far too restrictive to allow for the sort of dynamism that you'd like to see in economy where, where supply response, responds to rising prices and, and that sort of thing. So, so it really is the municipal land use rules that make it much harder to build than it should be. Can I just, I just want to, and that's a key point, and we want to get to the recommendations, that in particular and others, which are fundamental. Housing prices have taken off in the last 10 or 15 years. Is it fair to say then in the balance of demand and supply that it's gotten even more out of whack? Immigration's increased, that's a positive. Um, has the ability of provinces generally in Ontario in particular, in terms of keeping up with demand, gotten worse as time's gone on in part because of the policy um, inadequacy that you just mentioned? I think so. So we have seen an increase in, uh, in immigration, and, and a lot of that is flowing to our big cities. What we've also seen in our big cities is just we've kind of picked all the low-hanging fruit in terms of development sites that face minimal um, opposition. So, you know, if you picture Toronto 20 years ago, we had a lot of parking lots downtown. And when you're building a tower in a parking lot, you're not really displacing anything that anybody cares too much about. You're also a little bit removed from the stable neighborhoods where you have kind of the most opposition. So a lot of that, a lot of those sites have been developed over the last 20 years. And now we're kind of pushing against these neighborhoods where you have a lot more, you know, neighborhood character is kind of like the, uh, the, the, the planning lingo. And you do have a lot more of a status quo bias and established residents who don't want to see maybe the sort of intensification that would be called for just, just when looking at the amount of people that do want to move to the city. Yeah. So it's, I guess it's known as the missing middle. Um, in some terminology, which means those old established neighborhoods and building low rise townhouses on on buildings that may be one or two, three floors at most on major thoroughfares within the, you know, broadly the downtown area. Um, it's also known, I guess, in Toronto as the yellow zone, because that's the color of all those established neighborhoods. And there does seem to be movement in planning departments across the country with regard to reform in that area. Vancouver's taken steps, Toronto's taken steps considering more and others. I guess my question is that enough because I think part of the concern in this imbalance is what's really going to solve it is to build out as opposed to up, which means more sprawl, which means more carbon emissions and all the challenges that that kind of construction leads to. So I guess my question is, is missing, missing middle reform adequate to sort of, you know, rebalancing that supply and demand or are other factors going to be necessary? Yeah, yeah. So the missing middle refers to the fact that in many North American cities, and this is certainly true of, of Ontario's major cities, we have this bifurcated market. We have, you know, the vast majority of our land area within our cities is for low rise, one, two story detached, semi detached houses. And then in some pockets, we do see some high rise development and maybe a little bit of mid rise along the avenues. The missing middle refers to this middle typology of density uh, or typology or, or density, which is kind of like more dense than a semi detached house, less dense than maybe a six or eight story mid rise building. We've seen a lot of this construction in the pre war era where you see like four story walk apartments, triplexes, townhouses, and so forth. And we really haven't built many of them since the war and the 60s and the 70s when kind of the zoning rules that prohibit them ramped up. Um, and, and you make a good point, right? We, we, have, we have two options here if, if our cities are, are to grow. We could build out, and this is kind of characterized as urban sprawl, or we could build up, and this is intensification. The, the problem is, I mean, there are many problems with urban sprawl, including, you know, it contributes to long commutes, traffic congestion, and this sort of thing. But we also have a green belt which is like a regulatory tool that was used to constrain um, urban sprawl. So we can't build into the green belt. It's protected um, natural areas. Um, in the city, you mentioned that the neighborhood's land use area, and, and I'm speaking about Toronto specifically, but the same is true in, in all major Ontario cities. Um, the neighborhood's land use rule is, is colored in yellow in the official plan map. And we call this the yellow belt, right? It's it, like we can't build out into the green belt, but within the yellow belt, we can't build up. 
Um, and so we're not left with many options, which is why we're seeing tremendous um, price growth. Um, because when you can't increase supply, but demand keeps ticking up, well, you know, that, that, that kind of resolves itself in higher prices. So the missing middle refers to um, that typology. We are seeing some efforts being undertaken by municipalities to allow for a little bit more of this, but it's all been very kind of tame and, and like maybe baby steps when we, when we need something a little bit more ambitious. So in Toronto, we recently legalized laneway suites. If you have a, a laneway in the rear of your house, you could build a suite facing onto that laneway. We're seeing maybe like one, 200 of these built uh, per year within the broader context of Toronto building 20,000 units per year and probably needing to build 30 to 35,000. The next change is to allow for similar thing, but in houses for houses that don't have laneways. So these are called garden suites where you could put a, or in, in some parts of, uh, of the province, we call them accessory dwelling units, ADUs, where you could put one of these in your backyard. And just to kind of underscore the political um, environment, we have seven residents associations in Toronto that are appealing the, the council's recent decision to allow for this extremely modest form of intensification that you wouldn't even really be able to notice if you were standing on the street. So we're talking about the most modest possible changes being undertaken at the municipal level and even then facing opposition, which is why in, in my piece, I really call for, for more of a provincial involvement. Well, yeah, let's let's take you up, take up uh, that particular point, Chris. Um, the to, you know the paper outlines a series of recommendations, all with the goal of trying to improve the conditions for more housing construction. You know, if there's a kind of underlying idea that connects the dots with a lot of those recommendations, it's that one of, of in effect uploading responsibility for zoning uh, to the province, removing it from um, the kind of vagaries of local politics and and special interest pleadings. Um, you know, some would say um, that that is anti-democratic or that it, it, um, it is kind of anti-localism in the sense that it, it doesn't necessarily account for local preferences and, and so on. Maybe just make the case for why um, it is in the provincial interest um, that municipalities adopt liberal, um, small L liberal um, zoning rules um, to enable um, an increase in, in housing supply, even if it comes at the expense of uh, local interests or, or, or preferences. Yeah, and I've thought a lot about this because I generally am a fan of like local governance, subsidiarity. I think there is something to be said for um, baking local knowledge, kind of feedback loops into, into whatever we do. Um, but we do run into this problem with housing development specifically because we're changing the physical world by kind of introducing new homes, new density and so forth where the costs of new development are extremely localized. So if you have a four-story walk-up apartment going up next door, you might have some increased shadow impacts on your backyard. Um, there might be fewer parking spots available on your street. You might you know, have to suffer through two or three years of construction. So the costs are extremely localized, whereas the benefits are regional. If I work downtown Toronto, which is, which is the country's largest employment center, it doesn't matter so much whether I live you know, at Roncesville in the west end of Toronto or, or Leslieville, the east end, the, the, the kind of like supply overall within a reasonable commute of downtown is, is what matters to me. So when you have this, pro, this, this issue where costs are extremely localized, the entire municipal planning process really overweights kind of local voices who are being impacted by these costs and doesn't at all, as far as I can tell, account for the people who would benefit from increased development because, because the, whenever you have a public meeting for new development, the letters go within you know, a 300 meter radius of the, of the site. Um, I think you need kind of like a higher level of government, higher level of government to be able to take a broader view of what the regional benefits are. Um, you also have this problem where because Toronto has a ward system and, and, and councillors are, are kings of their ward and queens of their wards, um, they've been captured to some extent by the long term residents um, by the by, who form residents associations and as a general rule oppose intensification. So this problem of capture of localized costs, regional benefits, I think all kind of points to needing a higher level of government to, to take a more active role. And, and, and there is, uh, are steps being taken as well at the provincial and even the federal level for the first time. Is it fair to say, first time in a generation really, and it's not just in the last year or so, but in moving relatively quickly, the federal government's taking a real interest in this, including encouraging local zoning. I think one of the issues is going to be that balance between the three orders of government with regard to reform and the push and pull of that. 
Yeah, that's right. We, we've seen in the last federal election a more kind of fleshed out housing policy in all three major party platforms than, than I've ever seen. And I think as we're, we're being faced with this national productivity problem, which is largely being driven by municipal land use constraints. Um, so there's this tension between what is a national vision or even a provincial vision versus like a jurisdictional issue. So, so the way they kind of squared that circle was, was um, maybe some upzoning or land use liberalization strings attached to federal funding. Provincially, I think provinces have much more power. Um, whether we kind of frame it as, as an uploading or not, I think there is, there is some room for the province to set more guidelines and guardrails in terms of how restrictive municipalities can be. And uh, we're, we've certainly seen that in the first kind of PC government term. And, and I'd like to see much more of it, you know, regardless who wins, wins this next election. You know, we uh, at, the, at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, we often talk to students about externalities and um, concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. And you know, what's interesting here is these local decisions, particularly in the city of Toronto, which is such a major source of investment and employment and economic dynamism, um, that these local decisions manifest themselves in, um, in economic outcomes that affect the province. And indeed, I think one could argue the country, which is part of the reason we've seen growing interest um, at the federal level. Um, Chris, before we wrap up, um, maybe just a, a two-part question. One, you know, are there any particular recommendations that you think um, you know, could have the biggest bang for the buck in terms of the kind of suite of, of recommendations you put forward in the policy brief? And then maybe secondly, maybe paint a picture uh, for viewers about, you know, if the government um, were to adopt the totality of your recommendations, what, what sense do you have um, that it would have in terms of unlocking um, housing supply and in turn um, contributing to a, a kind of equilibrium between supply and demand and uh, a more uh, kind of stable uh, housing market in, in the province? Yeah, so, so my recommendations really did focus on this missing middle typology that, that you mentioned, Drew. So, so, I mean, the short of it is that I think you should be able to build a minimum of four units up to four stories on any lot citywide, which would be a radical, I mean, it doesn't sound that ambitious, but it would be a radical departure from the status quo, including in Toronto, right, including in Canada's biggest city. It's, it's kind of, you know, crazy to think that we're more restrictive than that, despite all this demand pressure. Um, Drew, you also asked whether I, I thought this was sufficient, this missing middle typology. I, I don't think it is. I do think you need high-rise, mid-rise construction, which is in many ways more efficient, certainly a more efficient use of land, right? Just fitting more units on you know, a given piece of, of land. Um, what I like about the missing middle is it, it, is it tackles this local political calculus head on. And, and in my view, you know, when, when, I see, when I see the sort of development projects that are being opposed in Toronto and, and in Ontario's major cities, um, it's not necessarily more fierce, you know, if you're talking about a high-rise development versus stacked townhouses in a neighborhood. Some people just don't like change at all. Um, and I think that if you were to legalize some kind of multi-unit housing everywhere, you would really overwhelm the opposition with just too many battles to fight. Um, and I think it would also open the door for more kind of ambitious high-rise development, say around transit nodes, closer to the downtown area. So so my, my focus was, I think, on the on the trickiest part, which is questioning this, this planning dogma that neighborhoods should be stable and their physical form should be stable. Um, like there is, no, there is no stability, right? We're either growing or we're shrinking. We've seen that in Toronto. Most of our neighborhoods have actually decreased in population and density. So, so by tackling that dogma head on, I think it also creates space for some of the you know, very obvious stuff like build towers on top of subway stations to, to happen in parallel. Drew, any final questions or comments from you? Transit-oriented communities, which we haven't touched on, and maybe you want to describe a little bit what those are and the value of those, because that has become you know, a big point of, uh, of contention in some ways, what they look like. And maybe the difference between transit-oriented communities and transit-oriented development and the balance in that, the yeah, different perspectives on um, you know, issues of equity and effectiveness. Yeah, so, so a framework that the provincial government introduced, um, I believe in 2018, was this major transit station area framework, which would basically allow for much more density in and around uh, transit stations. And, and they basically, the way they do that is they set targets in terms of required densities that municipalities then need to kind of update their planning, um, whether it's the official plan or zoning bylaw, their planning documents to, to allow for. Um, 
So, so again, and that kind of goes back to my paper focuses on the missing middle because this transient oriented development is already happening. The logic I think is pretty straightforward is, is we're creating these public amenities, right? These transit stations uh, that cost a lot of money and should be, should be to the benefit of as many people as possible. So it's a good place to kind of direct development. Um, I, I think probably these density targets will ramp up. They were set at a time when, when prices were not as bad as they are now. And even when immigrations level were not as high as they are now. So I think it's a great step and I think we should push it even further. But I think a, a more important frame, framework might be um, like employment oriented density, right? Like I'd, I'd rather put a tower in Baldwin Village where someone could walk to their office in the financial district than around Kipling Station. I mean, we should do both of it, but really cities, cities are primarily labor markets and people move to cities for access to as many good jobs as possible. And, and orienting development within reasonable commutes to the employment center should be, you know, should be a top priority. And, and often that means building around subway stations because you have that easy access to transit, but it also means upzoning anywhere near employment centers. Good yeah, well said, I, I, you know, someone said to me once um, that the labor market is screaming at the top of its lungs uh, for people to come to dynamic cities like Toronto and housing affordability issues is increasingly becoming an obstacle for people to uh, to follow and respond to those uh, demands. And so as Ontario policymakers think about these issues, they'd be, be well served by reading Chris Spokes um, policy brief at Ontario 360 entitled, it's time to build liberalizing Ontario's land use rules to boost market rate housing supply. Viewers can find it at our website, om360.ca. Chris, thanks again for contributing to our series and taking the time to speak uh, to Drew and me today.